بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. All praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who inspires us to good deeds and then rewards us for those very deeds that He Himself inspires. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants this taqama upon all our good deeds throughout this month of Ramadan and beyond. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of what we do in Shabbat. Uh, Inshallah ta'ala tomorrow will be the Khatm uh, al-Quran. Uh, the Khatm al-Quran is a very, very special moment throughout the month of Ramadan. The Quran has been, been recited juz after juz after juz in order to reach the completion. So after all the recitation, inshallah, tomorrow we will reach the completion. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned that one of the places and one of the times in which the dua is mustajab and accepted is uh, after the recitation of the entirety of the Quran. So that is the dua, which is accepted dua. And then on top of that, we in the month of Ramadan, on top of that, we've been listening to the recitation in the prayer, which is the best of worship. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our, best, uh, our listening to the recitation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept the Prophet's recital of the Quran. Allah gives all the Tawfi that can be present here. And it's an opportunity for us to bring our families and our friends and where possible to join us uh, at this auspicious and special moment where we're going to make this dua after the Quran will be completed, inshallah. Um, as we conclude speaking about the four Imams, the four illustrious Imams, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik bin Anas, Imam Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi'i, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. So I've talked about the first three Imams. Imam Ahmed, Imam uh, Abu Hanifa, who was born 80 Hijri and passed away 150 Hijri. Imam Malik, who was born 93 Hijri and passed away 179 Hijri. Then you had Imam Shafi, 150 Hijri to 204 Hijri. And the final great Imam is the one who has the title of Imam Ahl Sunnah. Allah. So he has this title from the scholars that he is Imam Ahl Sunnah, the Imam of Ahl Sunnah. And for very special reasons, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal was born in the year 164 Hijri. He passed away in the year 241 Hijri. And he lived a very difficult life. Allah. And he had great difficulties in order for the message of Islam to pass on correctly to the future generations. So Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. He was an extraordinary scholar, especially he excelled in the science of hadith. Uh, he <laughs> studied with Imam Shafi'i, he is one of his main teachers. Imam Shafi'i, at one point in his life, he came to Baghdad, he settled in Baghdad. Baghdad was the capital of the Abbasid Empire. And he settled there for some time before Imam Shafi'i moved to Cairo and passed away in Cairo. But he stayed in Baghdad for quite a long period. And as long as he was in Baghdad, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal would be studying with him. Produced the and, and would, would take him as a sole teacher. Mm -hmm. So Imam Ahmed Hanbal was very very close to Imam Shafi'i. Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal says one day to his son Abdullah bin Ahmed bin Hanbal, he says that a Shafi is one of the six individuals who I pray for after Allah. every prayer. So one of my six teachers Allah. that I don't ever forget to pray for. And he felt indebted to Imam Shafi'i. Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal also studied with the students of Imam Hanifa, Imam Abu Yusuf. Imam Muhammad bin Hassan al-Shaybani when he was younger. Imam Ahmad al Hanbal was very, very strongly attached to knowledge to such an extent that he did not marry until he reached beyond the age of 40. Solely because he was busy engaging in studying the deen. And he traveled everywhere in order to study the deen. All the way down to Yemen and to the furthest extent of the Islamic Empire at that time. He traveled wherever possible in order to hear the hadith of the Prophet in those days, the big tradition of learning was hearing the hadith of the Prophet And what does it mean to hear the hadith of the Prophet It doesn't mean just the Prophet said or did or was silent upon something. It meant that whoever is narrating, narrates from every individual before them to the Prophet and then says the words of the Prophet. So there's a chain of transmission. So what the scholars used to do in those days is that if so, a person had transmitted from their teacher, if that teacher was living, they were not satisfied just hearing from the student. They would go and travel back and travel in order to hear from the teacher directly. Because that would reduce the number of connections between them and the Prophet Right? And that would increase the level of the hadith. And this was one of the things that the hadith scholars strongly uh, strove for. To a certain extent, like if you look at the, the, the book of Imam al-Bukhari, Imam al-Bukhari in his hadith collection, Imam al-Bukhari passed away around about 255-56 Hijri. Imam Muslim, who is a student, but also almost at the same caliber, passed away in the year 260-261 Hijri. 
So these are late scholars, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal passed away from the 41 Hijri. Imam Bukhari was actually one of the students of Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. Imam Bukhari was one of the students of Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. Right? Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal was a, a giant when it came to hadith. But if you look at the Sahih al Bukhari, most hadith have like five connections or six connections between them, the Imam Bukhari and the Prophet. Then you have 21 or maybe 22 hadith in Bukhari. Which there's only three individuals between Imam Bukhari and, Muslim, yeah. and the Prophet. Yeah. Uh, they call the Thulafiyat of Bukhari. The Hadith of Bukhari was only three individuals. Right. So there is a strong, you know, to reduce the connections. So Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal would do the same. He would travel and he would learn as many Hadith as possible. Yeah. Imam Al Ahmed bin Hanbal is famed to have memorized a million Hadith, Allah. a billion uh, tra traditions. The traditions being the Hadith of the Prophet. The sayings of the Sahaba and the sayings of the pious scholars of the first generations. Oh, Collectively, oh, oh, oh. he memorized a million of these statements. Oh. And he compiled a book which was the largest book in his time, and there's probably not very many who got close to him, of 30,000 hadith oh, in a book. He collected 30,000 hadith around the box of the Prophet and the statements of the companions in a book called the Musnad of Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. So he was a huge, huge scholar, and he married there, like I said to you, and he emphasized studying, and then he began to teach. But Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal is mostly, beyond that, even though he attained huge greatness in studies, beyond that he was known for being tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in the time of Imam, Imam bin Ahmed bin Hanbal, initially the Khalifa was Harun al-Rashid, then Sun Amin, and then his son al -Muhtasim. The Second son of Harun Rashid, he was strongly influenced by the Mu'tazilas. The Mu'tazilas in those days, they were the heterodox, they were opposed to the Sunnah of Jama'ah, and they had many problematic uh, viewpoints. But the bigger issue was that they actually took political authority. So they had influence on Mu'tazil, and he brought it, he became a Mu'tazili, and then they began to stipulate the Aqidah upon everybody. And one of the points of the Aqidah was is that the Quran is creative. And uh, the Sunnah have the position that the Quran is uncreated because the Quran is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is from the essence of Allah and there is no part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is created. Allah is uncreated. Right? So that's the, the view of the Ahl Sunnah of Jama'ah. So in the time of Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, this Mihna, which is known as the Mihna, the great, great tribulation, fell upon the scholars. And many scholars gave in because of the pressure. Not just the, the, the peer pressure, are just being told to accept that, but scholars were being imprisoned and beaten and tortured yeah. and dying in the prisons. Yeah. And because that many of the scholars just gave in in order to protect it themselves and protect the community. Right? They only jihad was at their own level. Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal did not. Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, he remained in prison, being imprisoned for this for 28 months. Right? You can imagine in those days what prisons were like. He was beaten every single day when he passed out. Right. Someone asked him about Ahmed bin Hanbal for 28 months, every day being beaten until he passed out. Right. His body was covered in wounds. Someone asked him about Ahmed bin Hanbal, yeah, how could he have endured that? Right. Look at your peers, they couldn't endure that. They gave in, you didn't give in. So what caused you not to be able to endure that? He says that when I was in prison, I met another prisoner, and that prisoner was a thief. And when I was being beaten, a prisoner said to me, I'm a thief. I've been beaten 18,000 whips. I've received 18,000 whiplashes in order to say that I've stolen. I didn't accept that. I wasn't right, I still didn't accept it. You are upon haq, don't you dare move from the haq. So I'm going to remember to say that whenever I was beaten, until the point I was about to pass out, I would remember the words of that thief and I would send mercy upon that thief. And he was beaten until for 28 months, until eventually he was released. Then another Khalifa came and his name was Wathiq. He was just as bad. So you know, Ahmed bin Hanbal, when he was released from the prison, he didn't leave his house, not for the prayers, not for teaching, for nothing. He sought Allah's protection from the evil of the society that he's living in. So he kept himself in his house until the next Khalifa came and Mutawakkil, and that's when all the troubles went away. 
And Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, he was loved by the people and loved by the Khalifa. So at the end of all that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought him back to honor. And when Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal passed away in the year 241 Hijri, there's 800,000 plus people who attended his Hanazah. In those days, that is a lot of people. They said there were 60,000 women alone. There's more than 800,000 people who attended the Janazah because of the love and respect and honor they had for Imam Ahmed al-Hambal. Especially when he came to study for the <coughs> Imam Ahmed al-Hambal, uh, he was a hadith uh, collector and narrator. Just to mention just one interesting story regarding him. He had a friend called Yahya bin Ma'in, radiallahu anh. They were famous hadith, uh, uh, they used to be students and scholars together. And they would travel together in order to study the hadith. One occasion they were traveling and they stopped at a mosque. At the mosque they heard someone on the limba narrating hadith from the Prophet Allah. So the person when he used to decide the hadith, he used to mention all of the people he heard the hadith from. So the person was saying, remember I heard from Ahmed and Hanbal and from Yahya ibn Ma'in. From so on so, from so on so, back to the Prophet Allah. Now whoever decides, la ilaha illallah, this many times, for every word there's going to be a gold bird that's been made and so on so on so on so on so on so on. And he carried on and carried on and carried on. Until the majlis ended Allah. and Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in turned to Imam Ahmed al-Hanbal and said, did you narrate the hadith to him? I didn't. He goes, no, I didn't. So they went and they gripped that, the preacher. The, 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 the they were what they were wise, wise. In those days, they had teachers who could speak eloquently, but they weren't necessarily knowledgeable. And their purpose was just to encourage the people. And their scholars' purpose was for the people to take grounded knowledge and in order to uh, resolve the matters that they had. So they went and they spoke to him and said that, you narrated from Ahmed and Hanbal and Yahya bin Ma'in. Did you really narrate from them? You met them? He said, yes, of course I met them. He said, I'm Ahmed and Hanbal, he's Yahya bin Ma'in. None of us have narrated that he's you. He said that, you guys are stupid. Are you the only Ahmed and Hanbal in the world? <laughs> are you the only Yahya bin Ma'in? Imam Ahmed, Yahya bin Ma'in got angry. Imam Ahmed and Hanbal put his uh, sleeve on his, uh, his mouth and he began laughing. He said, leave him. <laughs> so, he just shows you how clever people can be. It doesn't matter what they position is that they write about, they always find the way out. So Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, he was one of the great scholars of the deen, the final of the four uh, Imams. And these four Imams I've mentioned to you, these are the great Imams whose madhaba survived. Otherwise, as I said to you early on, uh, in the early times, as many great scholars you had, that's how many madhabs you had. Because they were the go-to point for people to ask. And when the next generation came, it was a close time to rely upon the knowledge and that grew into a school. Otherwise, you had many, many famous scholars whose schools actually carried on a couple of hundred years and then they died out. You had, for example, Sufyan al Thawi, uh, you had Imam al Awza'i from Damascus, you had Dawood al Zahiri, and other individuals similarly, but later on, what happened? Because of the followers decreasing and dwindling and disappearing, the schools died out. And it was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wisdom that He retained these four schools. And all of Islamic scholarship has followed these schools. And I consider myself and others to be very, very fortunate that we, on a daily basis, we see people who are Maliki and Shafi'i, and sometimes people who are Hanbali, because we're very, very few, and most of us are Hanafi, in one place praying together. It just is a reminder of the diversity of the Ummah of the Prophet. <laughs> right? And we should always be mindful of that, because Allah subhanahu wa has given us a wide open path to paradise. It's only our doing if you narrow the path and make it difficult for the people. So it's a wide path. So if you see somebody raising their hands, that's how Imam Shafi'i prayed, went into Ruku, rose to Ruku and rose his hands. That is something the Prophet did in his lifetime. The only difference is when the Prophet passed away, how was he praying? That's what we're trying to determine. And every school is making the best effort. And every scholar is making the endeavor. And they are rewarded because the Prophet said that any person who is in authority, in a position of authority, and they make the effort to reach the right conclusion, they will be rewarded double if they are right, and they will still be rewarded single if they are wrong. Because they made the effort. But that is for those people who have the skill and the knowledge. That's not for anybody unless they have the skill and knowledge. No person can just practice surgery on a person, and the person is dead and then say, oh, I tried my best. It doesn't work like that. So imagine the deen, which is even more important. Allah. Yeah, because a surgery can kill a person in this life. Allah. Wrong advice in deen can kill a person in this life and in the next. Allah. And that's far greater in damage. So 
So it's really, really important that we are always following scholars who have studied properly, who have um, uh, a system, we have a system of ijazah that goes back through teachers, and then we rely upon them, and then we follow them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, will guide us.